My name's Professor Chloe James. Um, I would like to thank Richard very much for inviting me to come along today. My research is very different to, to Richard's, um, but um, he's been very kind to me since I started at Salford. And um, because we have both lived in Marseille, our shared love of Marseille has helped to make us very good friends. And so I'm, I'm really glad he invited me to come and share some of my research as well. Um, my main research um, is on bacteriophages, which you can sort of see in the background there, a massive giant phage. Um, these are viruses that infect bacteria, and I'm really interested in how they affect the biology of bacteria, uh, particularly in the context of disease. Um, but I thought I should share with you what I was doing in Marseille. So I was here at Le Timon, um, working with Jean-Marie Pages uh, in 2006 and to 2008. Um, and there we were interested in how antibiotics travel across the outer membrane of bacterial cells. Um, and so we, uh, it was a, a Marie Curie Networks project uh, and we were working uh, with Matthias Winterhalter um, in Bremen uh, with a, a group of biophysicists. Uh, and what we were doing, we were working with um, Enterobacteriogenes uh, purifying uh, porins uh, from Enterobacter erogenes, and I was working with Jean-Michel Bolla, who some of you might know, he's here in pharmacy, and he taught me a lot about protein uh, purification. And so we were purifying porins and placing them into um, a model of a lipid bilayer um, in, in Bremen, and then we were traveling, uh, uh, measuring um, electric transport across the porins in the presence and absence of antibiotics. And then by introducing mutations, we would understand how different antibiotics interacted with the porin and changed their rate of, of influx into the bacterial cell. Um, and then we had a lot of strains uh, from uh, the army hospitals um, in which, in, in the wild, uh, these mutations were happening all of the time <coughs> and reducing the efficacy of antibiotic treatment. And this was really helping to fuel uh, the development of more resistance mechanisms. Um, and so I, I gained a real love for molecular biology, um, but also understanding uh, and passion about the importance of understanding antibiotic resistance um, and how we can change behaviours to try and preserve our antibiotics um, and, uh, and to try to, in, in some way, curb the, the spread of further resistance. Um, and so this brings me to some of the work that we've been doing in Salford, and so Richard and Ian and I have been developing relationships in Uganda uh, for some time um, with the social scientists at Salford. So Salford's quite a small university, but we have lots of people working in very, very different areas. And so we can have quite interesting projects with lots of different people. Um, and so the social scientists have been working in Uganda for about 15, 16 years, talking about behaviors of healthcare workers in hospitals and how they handle antibiotics uh, and how they deal with, with poor resources. Um, and so we did um, a project where this is our, our PhD student, Gavin, uh, who worked out in Uganda for three years, uh, collecting samples of Staphylococcus aureus uh, from wounds from patients in the hospitals. Um, and there in the hospital, they do routine testing um, of a susceptibility assays to look at the resistance profiles. They didn't really do much with that though, because they didn't have a lot of resource and they only had the antibiotics they had, but they just gave to everybody anyway, regardless. Um, and what we did, so this is a bit of a complicated graph, but uh, what you can see, the circles here, these are the results of the standard disk diffusion assay to test uh, susceptibility. And oh, the black circles mean that there was resistance and the white means that there was susceptibility. Um, and so we tested. So we um, we tested a number of strains, but 50 of them we, we collected and we sequenced their genomes. Um, and so we could look at the strain differences, uh, but we could also try to match the genotypic profile to the phenotypic profile uh, to try and understand a bit more about the mechanisms of how the bacteria were becoming resistant. So the squares are um, whether or not that strain had. Um, the antimicrobial resistance gene that could explain the phenotype. Um, and what you can see is that sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. Um, so some of the strains um, you can see uh, were, were almost pan-resistant, 
Um, and sometimes, so you can see this is a sofloxacin. Um, sofloxacin is a really important antibiotic when you're thinking about Staphylococcus aureus because this tells you if you have an MRSA or not. Um, unfortunately, the hospital did not have many sofloxacin discs. Uh, so the information they have about whether or not it's an MRSA is quite weak. And this highlights the issue of, of resource. Um, but when you did see sofloxacin resistance, for example, we also found the MECA gene, uh, which encodes for an alternative penicillin binding protein that explains the resistance. Um, and so we were able to do that in a number of cases. Um, now, this information to the clinicians in the hospital was not particularly interesting because they said, well, we don't really care about the genes. We care about the patient lives or dies and what antibiotic we should give. But what we found was so this is us um, presenting to the infectious, um, the um, infection control team of the, of the hospital. Uh, and we presented the data. Um, and actually, all of the nurses and the midwives were really, really interested in the data and wanted to know more. And it really introduced um, a thirst for more knowledge and more understanding about what resistance was. Um, and this, we think, is helping in samples being taken more quickly and, and the nurses talking to the, um, to the lab scientists in the lab and understanding the results that were coming back. So this data contributed to the first anti antibiotic round in the hospital in Fort Portal to help them be a bit smarter about the antibiotics that they used. Um, so that's something that I'm really quite passionate about is in public engagement and helping people better understand the science so that they can change their behaviours. So at Salford we also have lots of computer scientists and people developing virtual reality experiences. And so this is something that we de developed this is um, a biofilm that I grew of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we took pictures of it, and uh, we imaged it, and we turned it into a virtual reality environment. And in this environment, um, you can learn about biofilms, you can fire antibiotics at the biofilms and see what they do, um, and you can learn about if you don't take your antibiotics properly, then resistance can, um, can develop and get worse. Um, so we go on tour with festivals with this, and uh, it, it really grabs people's attention and helps them to remember the facts better. So that particular, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa is actually the bacterium that I work with more. So I want to switch now and talk a bit about my bacteriophage work. Um, so my, I work with Pseudomonas aeruginosa particularly in the context of the cystic fibrosis lung. So patients with cystic fibrosis have thick mucus lining their airways. Um, they develop chronic bacterial infections, usually with multiple different species, and so this is quite a complex polymicrobial environment. But Pseudomonas aeruginosa usually dominates that environment, and it's the most common pathogen um, that is associated with more severe uh, disease and eventually death in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, I'm from Liverpool originally, um, and when I first moved back from Marseille, I went back to Liverpool. Um, and I was working with this strain that's called the Liverpool Epidemic Strain, uh, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This was the first time that um, it was discovered that Pseudomonas aeruginosa could transmit from person to person uh, rather than directly from the environment. And this strain is, it was causing big problems and it was spreading through all of the hospitals in the UK and it spread to other countries as well. So we sequenced the genome and we found the orange bits in the, in the genome here are prophages, so bacteriophages, so it had five different active phages in its genome. Um, and some mouse experiments told us that the phages were helping the pseudomonas to uh, be more competitive in the lung and to survive in the lung. So we isolated the phages. Um, this is a video from one of our animation students just to show you the power of phage. Um, these are phages coming down, they bind to specific receptors on the bacterial surface, they inject their DNA, and then they encode an enzyme that bursts the cell open, killing it and releasing more phages. So most people who know about phage know about that aspect of phage, that they can kill bacteria and therefore they can be used as a therapy, as an alternative to antibiotics, and there's a real... Um, uh, momentum building again now about phages 
Um, I know phages were discovered over 100 years ago by uh, Felix Dorel in the uh, Pasteur Institute. Uh, but then phage research was very much forgotten. Now people are getting much more excited again and excited about the possibilities of phage therapy. But not all phages kill bacteria. Some of them actually make them stronger. And so the phages that I work with are um, lysogenic phages. And when they infect the bacterium, they inject their DNA, but they integrate into the genome and sometimes they can encode for toxins and they can make more severe pathogens. Um, and so I'm really interested in understanding that. And so the phages that we found in Pseudomonas, we want to know what they're doing to Pseudomonas. So some phages can kill, some phages encode toxins that can make more severe pathogens. Our phages don't do that. We sequenced their genomes, we looked at their genomes, there's no toxin genes, there's no real obvious virulence factors. But what we think these phages are doing is controlling their bacterial host. They encode a lot of small RNAs, um, and what we think that they're doing is they're affecting the gene expression of lots of different virulence factors in the pseudomonas, controlling how it behaves. So we wanted to investigate that further. So we induced, so um, prophages can be induced out of bacterial cells by stressing them out with either with UV or with antibiotics or with oxidative stress. Um, and so we treated the layers and we, we got the phages out and we purified them. Um, and one by one, we infected the phages into our lab PET strain PAO1. And this enabled us to look at what the phages are doing in isolation from each other rather than all together, which was then quite messy. So we then compared the growth profiles of the bacterium carrying different phages to see how it behaved. Um, and what we found uh, was that in rich media, the, when they carried the phage, most of them grew, they survived a little longer, so their profiles were a bit better, they grew a bit better than the wild type with no phages. But then in reduced uh, nutrient conditions, everything changed, and now the wild type grew better, and those in the presence, of, uh, uh, those that were carrying phages have uh, had reduced growth. We also did some experiments with Galeria melanella. So this is um, an invertebrate model of infection. Um, this is the, the larvae of a wax moth, um, and it has a rudimentary immune system. So it's a little, one step up from a test tube, basically. Uh, but we can use this model to investigate virulence. Um, and so we um, infected the Galeria melanella with our wild type carrying one, two, three, four different phages. Um, and what we found was um, that the larvae died most quickly when they were infected with the wild type strain. When they were infected with the strain that carried three different phages, in fact, they survived longer. And so this led us to believe that maybe the phages are damping down the virulence, reducing the virulence of the bacterium, thereby allowing it to survive for longer in the lungs because it's causing less havoc and so it will be cleared by the immune system uh, less easily. Um, but we wanted to investigate the mechanisms of, of how that happens. So we sequenced the genomes um, of, our prophate, of our lysogens and we found for the most part so phage three always integrated into the same place. Phage two usually did. But phage four is a transposable phage. So this one jumps around in the genome um, and can cause mutations. And so that can drive adaptation of the host. Uh, but it still didn't really, under, um, really explain um, why the phages are having such an effect. Um, and so for that, we need transcriptomics. Um, so we, we use the latest tools to re-annotate um, our phage genomes, and so there are four. We've managed to isolate three. This one we still haven't managed to isolate it because we can't find a host that we can infect it with to, uh, to produce plaques. Um, we still didn't find any obvious virulence factors, and so we still think, but we did find a lot of um, uh, small RNAs um, in the phage sequences. So we performed an RNA-seq experiment. Um, so we used very controlled conditions in inducing and non-inducing conditions. We extracted <laughs> RNA and then we sequenced the RNA to see which host genes were switched on and off. Um, and so this heat map shows you um, across the bottom the different strains. So the first one, this was the wild type. 
Um, and then across here are uh, the same strain but with different phage complements. Um, and these are groups of genes clustered together according to how they're expressed. So these aren't single genes. But what it shows you is that the gene expression levels are very different and they're different when there are different phages there. And they're different again when there are two phages sitting in the same genome or three phages sitting in the same genome. So what we found was that when there were two phages together, there were much stronger changes in gene expression. And then when there were three, everything seemed to calm down again. So this is where we're up to with the story. We don't really know exactly what's happening yet, but we know that there are changes in the expression of genes involved um, in motility and virulence, and we've started to investigate this, and we've got some phenotypic data to back this up, uh, but also in lots of metabolic pathways and biofilm formation um, and drug efflux pumps. So we think that these phages may well be driving resistance mechanisms as well. So we really want to try and understand that. Um, so, in summary, this is what we know so far, that the phages can coexist in the, in the genome. With, they're having influence on the host genes, but they're also influencing each other's behavior. Uh, they're affecting motility and nutrient usage, we know that for sure. Um, but I would quite like to, so I'm, I've been quite closed into pseudomon these pseudomonas phages for about 15 years now. And I would quite like to kind of apply these ideas to look at phages in other species, maybe some of the species that Richard and Ian are investigating. So we would like to, to move into those new areas. Phages is a massive, massive topic in the UK and I think in the world right now. The UK government is having an inquiry into whether or not uh, we should invest a lot more money in phages as a potential therapy. Uh, but there again is a big public engagement a project that we need to understand how people feel about phages and, and their expectations of phages. So one of the reasons why phages were kind of forgotten about was that in the past people didn't understand how specific phages are and how you have to prepare them very, very carefully or understand uh, the population dynamics and, and the, the, which strains are affecting which people and where. And so people didn't do that in the past, so people thought phages, sometimes they work amazing, but most of the time they don't work, so they're useless. But now that we understand more about the behaviours of different phages, we can actually apply them um, much more cleverly and, and much more effectively. Um, so we have done some fun stuff. We've, done, we've created a virtual reality lung, um, and in this environment, people um, can experience uh, the microscopic world of the lung, and in their they look and they find these different communities that are coexisting in the mucus, um, and then phages come down and they experience what happens when a lytic phage bursts a cell open, what happens when a lysogenic phage can make a bacteria more resistant to antibiotics, to try and understand the nuance of those different um, states. And then we've also created a massive phage it doesn't look like it wants to work, which is probably good and good because I've probably run out of time. Yes, that's not going to work. I'll describe it instead. So we made a phage head that's about this big, um, and we suspended it in a room about this size, and we projected images of, of space and the beginning of, the of life, the world, and everything. And people can walk into the room, and they can see this phage, and they sit, and they feel zen. Um, and they think about the science that we've been talking to them about and then they come out um, and we have long conversations about phage um, and so I'm really happy that I'm in Salford and I get to do these fun things and talk to people about their understanding of science as well as doing um, the lab side of things. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.